Welcome, everybody, again to another episode of the Idea Me Show, the show that profiles the humans behind the really big ideas uh, that are shaping our world, inspiring creation, and really great stories. Uh, I'm Ira Pastor. I'm your health, longevity, and aging ambassador along for this journey through the complex architecture uh, that represents life, health, aging. So for the last few months, we've been profiling many of the cutting edge technologies that are in the pipeline for moving us from this 20th century symptom treatment model of healthcare to you know, what we refer to as a 21st century model, uh, curative model, one that can have an impact on many chronic degenerative diseases responsible for human degeneration, suffering, and death, and also potentially usher in a, a new era of extended health span and lifespan. However, you know, we need to be honest that the future is still being developed as we speak. And every year we still watch around 65 million people across the globe uh, die. Uh, two thirds of those leave this world due to the disease of aging, about one third due to some form of acute trauma. And whether these folks have cancer or heart disease or kidney failure or sepsis or auto accident, the final biologic state that each of them pass through as they leave this world is that of the death of the brain. Um, so today we're going to be discussing brain death uh, with the utmost expert anywhere on this planet. So brain death we currently define as the complete loss of brain function, including the involuntary activity necessary to sustain life. Uh, an ad hoc committee at Harvard Medical School back in 1968 published a, a pivotal report that defined brain death as irreversible coma. And this Harvard criteria gradually evolved uh, and gained a status as a consensus towards what is known as brain death today. Uh, when placed in the wider continuum of disorders of consciousness, it differs from the persistent vegetative state where the person is alive yet has some autonomic function. Uh, it's also distinct from coma, uh, whether that's it medically uh, induced or caused by injury or illness. Um, and it's also different from what is known as locked-in syndrome, and we'll get into these topics a little later on. And as many of the above disease conditions, brain death is an area, including the related disease disorders of consciousness, that we need to have a much better understanding of moving forward for an integrated approach to dealing with disease and degeneration. So today's guest, who is at the very epicenter of this space, you know, a thought leader's thought leader, who's gonna take us further along this theme uh, into the work that's been done in this space, new discoveries and sort of the realm of future technologies uh, that could potentially allow us to eventually blur the lines in the future uh, is Dr. Calisto Machado. Uh, Dr. Machado is both a medical doctor with a specialty in neurology uh, and a PhD uh, in clinical neurophysiology and a senior professor of the Institute of Neurology and Neurosurgery in Havana, Cuba. Uh, he is the president of the annual International Symposium on Brain Death and Disorders of Consciousness. And he is literally the author, author of hundreds of peer-reviewed publications on topics as broad as brain death, disorders of consciousness, neurointensive care, as well as what has been become known as sort of one of the Bibles of research in this space for neurologists, neurosurgeons, intensivists, and transplanters alike, a book called Brain Death, A Reappraisal. Uh, all that being said, Dr. Machado, thanks so much for coming on the show today. Hello, hello, hello my friend Ira. Thanks for the introduction. Uh, you are talking as if I will be a movie star. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, in this space, that's, you know, <laughs> in essence, what you are. Um, <laughs> you know, typically on this show, we, we, uh, we start off by giving our guests uh, the floor. And basically, for everyone that doesn't know about you, uh, to learn about you, sort of tell us about you, uh, where you grew up how you eventually you know, got interested in science, how you got interested in medicine, and ultimately you know, your path to now in 2019 being at the very epicenter of the knowledge and the study of uh, neurophysiology, neurology, and this area that is known as the disorders of consciousness, including brain death. Well, I was born in Cuba and have Matanzas is a place in, near Varadero Beach. And uh, I, man, I run all my studies, primary studies, high school in Cuba, and also at the University of Havana, I run my career of medicine. Since I was a child, uh, because of my 
also my father was a doctor, he, he showed me how to love the study of the brain. And let me tell you, since I was in the first year of my career, I was sure that I was going to do a specialty on neuroscience, on neurology, on clinical neurophysiology, but I was sure. I never had doubts. And I began to, uh, to work at the Institute of Neurology and Neurosurgery when I graduated. And, and then I run my specialty first in clinical neurophysiology and afterwards in neurology. I mean, I have both specialties. And, uh, but I began to work in the neurocritical care. And I began to face disorders of consciousness. I began to face uh, brain death, brain death patients or so-called brain death patients. And really, my my thinking went to the, the the limits between life and death. And since that time, I began to work to, to do research on this area. Also, I have been also, uh, well, that's why my relationship with you, because I do believe in that we can develop neuroprotective ways of uh, of uh, protect, excuse me, the brain. Because when you have a heart attack and you have a, uh, you have a, uh, that no flow, no blood flow goes to the brain. I mean, all of the, all, for example, the kidneys can survive for, for long time, for several hours. But you know that the brain is very, very sensitive to the lack of, oxygen and, and blood and that's why uh, it began the the problem that when the does the brain die after a cardiac arrest and uh, let me tell you the the in 1959 it was discovered or described the 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 so-called brain death state why because of the intensive care unit. Because before the intensive care unit, uh, you, it was impossible to keep a person, a patient, uh, without, with, uh, with, 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 for example, uh, applying CPR. But what did you did afterwards? You need monitors, you need uh, uh, everything to keep this body, let's say body, uh, with, Technology, mm -hmm. and then it was it began a discussion. What does it mean to die? Uh, recently, there was there was a, a New Yorker a New Yorker uh, uh, article that mentioned my participation in uh, in in uh, the case of Jahai Madmash. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and and it's it's interesting, no? Because the the journalist called, what does it mean to die? Mm -hmm. It was very, I mean, attractive, this title. And, but I do believe that's why I have relationship with BioQuark, that we can develop systems, ways, drugs to protect the brain and other organs. For example, uh, a, a, a subject can go can um, go to a swimming pool which is free, fro frozen, mm -hmm. and after forty five minutes we can apply CPR and recover the the patient. Why? Because the cold water protected the brain. Hypothermia is known as the main uh, neuroprotector nowadays. Mm -hmm. And but why not like bioquark? Can we protect P, uh, patients with a BQA? I don't know. We need to do research on that. I mean, we we, sh we can do a lot of things. And, uh, and that's why I don't only work in brain death. I work in disorders of consciousness, in coma, parasitic vegetative state, minimally conscious state, and I think that the most important in the neocritical care is to protect the brain when the patient is still in coma. Mm -hmm. Because to, to, to make the diagnosis of brain death is, is to say, now, an answer, 
does brain death mean death? This is a great question. What do you think, uh, Ira? <laughs> <laughs> we'll, get, we'll get into that topic a little later on. Going, going back a little bit. So, you know, um, let, let's just talk for a moment about Cuba because, um, you know, obviously uh, it, the country is very close to the United States, um, but most Americans don't, you know, they, th they think Cuba normally to think about things like cigars and rum and salsa music and so forth. They don't normally think about biotechnology, yet there's, you know, there's been quite a bit going on uh, in Cuba in the last several years. Um, you know, you have the Center for Genetic Engineering and Biotechnology, you know, it's, it's, it's focused on all sorts of really high-end biomedicine, infectious diseases, neurodegeneration, cancer, and so forth. Your, your institute, uh, there was something in the news recently about uh, uh, the first sort of immunotherapy alliance between um, uh, the Cuba Center for Molecular Immunology and, uh, and Roswell Park Cancer Center up here in New York. So there's really a lot of going on. Can you just talk from your, you know, from your perspective a little bit on sort of how you have seen uh, throughout your time sort of the the biotech and biomedicine research space evolve in Cuba over the last few decades. Let me let me tell you. Uh, in spite of we have faced many economical problems, as you know, uh, the biotechnology in Cuba I think that it has it has a very high standard. For example, in cancer research, they are they are producing monoclonal antibodies. To different uh, cancer, uh, even even for the to, they supply it for some type of brain tumors, and they are providing some drug for treatment of, of uh, the diabetes. And there is a, a a great development in this area. And moreover, the in even in different specialties like cardiology, like. Uh, neurology like uh, oh we have a, a, a the highest standard uh, of medicine mm -hmm. for example recently we have a uh, in my yeah. institute a three a three tesla machine and in, i'm doing everything that we can do in the in the for the brain the brain tactography diffusion weighted imaging and so on that you can you can see them in my in my publications, in, in regarding biotechnology, I think that there is a a growing a growing development develop um, uh, in, in different areas of the, the for example, I I know that uh, USA uh, had a had a uh, relationship to get Cuban monoc monoclonal antibodies to treat cancer. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's not my area, but I know because of the news, you know? Right, right. Yes. And uh, I think that in spite of our, that we have a phase, uh, as I told you, many economical problems, the biotechnology development is higher than in other Latin American countries, for example. It's very interesting. It's, it, it's, it's, extre it's extremely um, interesting and exciting when you just think about the amount that's going on in, you know, what is it, you know, a rather small country uh, with, as you say, these sort of economic issues, but nonetheless, you do get uh, sort of top tier. Um, we have a, we have a center, we have a center of biotechnology with very very mm -hmm. high and uh, important results that you can find in in, in publication in high impact journals in the world. Sure. Sure. So tell, tell us a little bit more about uh, your work on a daily basis. So I mean, obviously you do a lot of traveling now and lecturing um, and you, you, know, you have gotten a visa and you're in the United States quite a bit, but what is typically Dr. Machado's day like at uh, the Institute for Neurology and Neurosurgery? Are you mainly- Well, I, I am now a, a senior professor and researcher, no? Mm -hmm. I have I have my team. Uh, I will. I will. Uh, excuse me. I will call you. Okay. Okay. Uh, I am. Um, I am a senior professor. Excuse me. Uh, of uh, of an in your role. I have uh, my team. Mm -hmm. uh, now a lot of colleagues working with me. I don't only work in brain death. I, for example, I'm, I am doing. Uh, a great, um, I mean, a good, re um, high standard research on autism 
and uh, apply a low-level laser, laser therapy with, with fantastic and pioneering results. Mm -hmm. And I also am the advisor, the mentor of different uh, uh, genre specialists, uh, specialists doing stroke, neurocritical care, and so on. And um, a mentor of PhD programs. Now, now I have a lot of collaborators, including my my daughter, <laughs> my my son-in-law, and I have my team. That's the most important thing. And of course, I, I devote a great part of my time to write papers and to process data from my collaborators, and that's why I publish a lot. Sure, publish a lot in in high impact journals. Because, yeah. because if you publish in, as an, in, in journals written in Spanish, no, nobody will know your, your, your papers, mm -hmm. and uh, you need to to, mm -hmm. to publish in, in English uh, written in uh, journals, which appear in PubMed, National Library of Medicine. If not, nothing will be known about you. Sure. Yeah, no, that definitely, and it's um, you know when one when one goes in there and, and puts your name in, it's uh, it is is truly a uh, a treasure trove of of the last several decades of your work, and you know it's uh, it's an important body of literature. Um, so you know you're in Philadelphia now. You've come up. Uh, from Havana to the 2019 annual meeting of the American Academy of Neurology. Um, can you tell us a little bit about um, how the conference is going, what you're going to be talking about, what types of interesting things you're seeing? Uh, you know, you mentioned the Jahai McMath um, uh, case, of course, which you were involved in for several years, and you mentioned it may be doing some very interesting new findings. I don't know if you're if you're allowed to disclose on the show or not uh, prior to, to whatever you're going to be talking about, but can you tell us a little bit about just sort of your what, what's been going on today at the conference and, and what you're most excited about uh, and what you're talking about while you're here? Well, you know, for me, the, the American Academy meeting is the, the most outstanding uh, uh, the, the conference in the world uh, in, in Neurology. For me, there's nothing, even the, the World Congress are not the same. For me, the American Academy of Neurology is uh, the most outstanding, and mm -hmm. and of course you can see he, you can see here everything everything about neuroscience. But uh, today we, I have a meeting with uh, some colleague from the Pan American Organization of Neurology because uh, we want to to join our countries with the support of of of, uh, of the American Academy of Neurology and and the World Federation of Neurology. Yeah, I I. Um, I want to. I want to. I want to, to to present and to discuss my recent. You know, I was involved in the Jahai McMath case. Uh, probably is the most famous suspected brain death case in the world. Right. I was called in in 2014. So, you know, 2000. Yes, 2000. 2014, and and as an expert. And when I uh, we uh, we studied, they gave me the data and processed it with my team, and I found that she was not really brain dead. And uh, based on on the Jahai findings, I have described a new state of disorder of consciousness, not previously described. Uh, because can you, can you tell us a little bit more about? I mean, from what you can disclose. Uh, that you know, once again, you're, I know you're presenting, and there's issues with, with presenting and the, and the papers and so forth. But could you talk a little bit about that? Because I think a lot of people don't quite understand. You know, they know there's a continuum of disorders of consciousness here: PVS, coma, deep coma, and so forth. Tell us a little bit, if you could, about this new state, because I think that's probably one of the most exciting findings. You've been quite excited about it, but if you can just talk a bit in more detail about that, that's Really you mean to talk? You mean to talk about Jahai? No, no, just about sort of this new coma state that you've been talking about. Oh, the problem is that I found in Jahai yeah. that she, um, when you look at her, uh, I didn't make the clinical examination, but everybody found that she didn't have any brain cell reflexes, 
and she, in fact, when I study her, she, after nine months, whoa, we study. I took the the data given by by my American the American colleagues. The the brain was preserved, and by concept, uh, brain death state. There's no cerebral blood flow, mm-hmm. and all the the structures, brain structures, intracranial were preserved. Second, uh, I they, she had. A, Preserve EEG, electroencephalography activity. Uh, third, I tested her by something that is heart rate variability when her mother talked to her. And, and she had autonomic response, I mean, uh, responsive with emotion. And it's related with something that I didn't know, but Dr. Schumann uh, found that she, in videos, uh, given by her mother that she responded to orders of her mother. It's impossible to think in the patient that is uh, in, uh, in uh, you, you see her no brainstem reflexes in full coma and, and I mean deep coma. Nobody had described that state. Mm-hmm. Uh, the Schumann said that it's a minimal conscious state and no, the, for me, it's not. It's a minimal conscious state is another thing. It's a, it's a patient who uh, went out from PVS and then she, she or he can respond to simple orders, open he, he, their, he, his or her eyes. It's different. I mean, not previously described. I submitted this paper to the neuro- Neurocritical Care Journal and I expect it will be published. If not, I will continue to, but I expect it will be published. And uh, let me tell you that uh, I told her, Jahaim had matched a new state of disorder of consciousness. Uh, it's a, for me, it's an amazing discovery for myself. I, mean, I think it's a new proposal for, uh, as a new state of disorder of consciousness. Yeah, it's, it's, Let's see if uh, my colleague is in the word accepted, but I accept it. <laughs> well, <laughs> I, 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 everything that you have talked about and, and written about to date regarding it, it clearly seems that uh, that you were on the right path with that one. And um, you know, it takes a while, I guess. As you know, you're you're more familiar with it, but it does quite take you know, a while for these. You know, people. this is an area that discussions be- continue and continue. I have organized eight international symposium symposia on brain death and disorders from consciousness. Right. And in every, in every symposium, you find people who agree with the, or accept the brain death, other don't, they don't accept, and they're included ethical, philosophical, legal issues. For example, the, the case of Jahalman Mash, I don't, you can tell me, but I think that he has, it has been the case most fully uh, followed by the international and American press. It's incredible that yeah. it's, it's how many articles you can find about. If you Google Jahaiman Match, you will find hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of articles. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it uh, it was it was definitely a flood of. Uh, I mean, I, you know, in a positive way, I think you might agree that it definitely brought between that and also remember uh, Whitney Houston's uh, daughter. Um, it, it brought the topic at least out in the open, uh, which is you know it, it's something I guess you know people don't talk about that much in terms of death and brain death, but it allowed at least people to to talk about it. Um, so you know, going back a few months now, you know. Um, 50 years um, have gone by now since the, uh, the Harvard Ad Hoc Committee. And, you know, another very important uh, conference meeting that you were at recently uh, took place uh, up at Harvard on this 50th anniversary of the, the brain death um, sort of definition. And you were present there yes. with, with a bunch of other thought leaders. I think, yes, it was, uh, it, was, it was held in the 50th anniversary last year. Right. It was a great idea to, I mean, to, as, a, as a, let's say, because it was in May or May in, in, in 2018, 
at the Harvard, and it was an amazing, an amazing uh, 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 conference because the, the, uh, we were able to listen uh, lectures from, from the legal point of view, from the ethical point of view, uh, from the neurological point of view, like uh, Alan Schumann, uh, Dr. Burnett, Jim Burnett, uh, and uh, uh, Tadeusz, uh, Tadeusz Pope from the legal point, from, uh, regarding legal issues. And it was amazing. I mean, the most outstanding lecturers, speakers in, in this area came. I really enjoyed that, uh, that, and I presented my point of view uh, of uh, that Jahai was not brain dead. It, it created some discussions because uh, all the um, many American neurologists said that she was brain dead, but she was not. Mm -hmm. And it, it, in some way, it created for me. It created for me some discussion, well, friendly discussions. But she is no, She was not. And uh, I know that at the beginning, uh, she was discussed. Uh, it, it didn't came from a scientific point of view. It would came from uh, religious, legal, because their their parents didn't want to accept that she was brain dead. Right. But it was not based on, on science. It was in, in, I mean, in family belief or legal belief. But at the end, when we study, when we study her, she was not. She was not. So along, you know, taking that uh, sort of 50th anniversary now um, and looking forward. Um, I don't know how much you've had a chance to, you know, in recent weeks see the, uh, the news on uh, the, the study that was done up at uh, Yale University. You know, it was, um, it was done in pigs uh, where they looked at the brains of, of pigs that were slaughtered, uh, decapitated, in fact, um, and, you know, the brains were, you know, taken and washed and reconnected in some fashion with the various devices um, and you know there was this finding that there was electrical activity in these brains much further out hours and hours later than normally thought. Um, I, I don't know if you've had much exposure to that news with everything you have going on but you know I, I just put it in the uh, basket of things that um, you know looking forward uh, say now 20 years. Uh, no, and of course, you know, all disclosure that, that you have consulted for us in the past, but putting BioQuark aside for a moment and just thinking sort of a general of the space, if Dr. Machado has this crystal ball and is looking out now 10, 20 years, what are you most excited about? What are the things that let, let me tell you something. I, 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 I have known in my life that you cannot say in science that this will not occur. Mm -hmm. you, you, you should never say that. Uh, there's a, an experience uh, that occurred in the 70s, I remember exactly, that there, the, uh, an American professor made a head, a head transplant in a monkey. Right, right, right. In the monkeys. In the monkey. Do you remember that? Yep. yep. Yes. And also uh, remember the Soviets in the former Soviet Union, they they were able to to put in a dog two heads. Uh, you can imagine that in in some way, we have now the possibilities to make a, a, a head transplant in a man. Technology with a te consider the technical point of view. How many ethical discussions will We'll, we'll, we'll have our, I don't know. I think, I think, remember that in the 50s, 40s, 30s, uh, a, a, a heart arrest produced death without any doubt. Okay, well, and afterwards the CPR began, the intensive care developed, and then you can keep a, a, a patient after a cardiac arrest of several minutes, and recover, Absolutely. recover him. 
then cardiac arrest is no longer is no longer uh, uh, that you can say when you have a cardiac arrest you will die. No, no, and then you have extracorporeal machines, you have pacemakers, uh, you you have anything, and then what would happen in the near future with this uh, about the neuroprotection? I don't know, but I'm sure that patient that surely would die uh, because of cardiac arrest or the brain would die because of cardiac arrest, probably the, the, the I mean, the 911, the, the ambulance will have some type of neuroprotector injected and then this case could be safe after many, many minutes of, uh, of cardiac arrest and, and the brain will be, um, I mean, completely recovered. I'm sure, I'm sure that it will happen. And, sh and I know that, for example, you are working on that with your BQA. Uh, the problem is to protect the brain, not only the brain, you need to protect their kidneys, you need to protect everything. And, but I, I see that in the near future, uh, probably we will need to change our concept even about brain death, even, even. Thank you for that. Uh, that's yes, yes, I, I don't see, I mean, you can stop and, and, and say, no, it, 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 we will face this, this, and nothing will occur. No, it's impossible. And we don't know what will happen in 20 years. Sure. Yeah, we don't. And as a scientist, I say, nowadays we have this. In 10 years, I don't know. <laughs> because, for example, AIDS, AIDS was... Um, uh, uh, the queen, the queen singer died. Now the queen singer, Fred Mercury, would not die. Right. No, Absolutely. it's uh, that's uh, you can imagine the uh, Fred Mercury was uh, probably one of the richest uh, 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 men in the world, and he died. He, he. But nowadays, with the uh, ret retrovirus um, drugs, he would live. He would be singing. <laughs> Yeah, a lot of these, a lot of these diseases that were death sentences uh, just a couple of years ago are now. Yeah, it's 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 amazing what the entire biomedical community, uh, when they put their resources and minds to it, can can really. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, I think that, and, and and now we are doing a lot of things in genetic uh, to to uh, to cure diseases by a, a genetic uh, technology. For example, there are many, many, many uh, neuromuscular diseases, which now they are, for example, uh, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis is nothing. It, it's a, I mean, it will leave you, will lead you to death. But what would happen in the, in the few in the next few years? We don't know. Well, it's good that you're. It's good that you're working on these topics. So it's uh, uh, it's going to be a very promising uh, next decade or two, and it's, it's going to be exciting Look, times. I do believe. I do believe it, and 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 that's why I want to continue working in this, uh, let's say, space between a comatose patient and a dead patient, brain dead patient, mm -hmm. which are the limits. Which exactly. are the functions that we can protect not to lose the, these functions exactly. of the brain? How can we protect the brain? There is because sometimes uh, you uh, a stroke patient arrive to neurocritical care, you treat them with TPA or, or something, and afterwards it's only to keep uh, the, the functions, no infections. But he can uh, that and goes to uh, hemiparesis and. There is something that we need to to go on and to go forward and to solve this issue. Absolutely. So, coming back now to you, um, because you are, you know, you are in the middle of all of this, and and you, you know, obviously have had a very exciting career uh, to date, and hopefully many more decades. Um, have there been along your path? Um, mentors, uh, people that have influenced you, people that 
uh, you can think back and say, you know, if it wasn't for so and so, um, I would have decided to do something else. <laughs> Uh, I would have not been in neurology anymore. I would have become uh, a cardiologist. I would have been. Was there? Are there any particular people that you would like to point out that it really influenced Dr. Calisto Machado into uh, in, 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 in my personal in my personal history? You say? Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, the 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 former, I mean, the the first urologist in Cuba, Professor Rafael Estrada, was a close friend of my father, who was a doctor. Mm -hmm. And then he really, he really, uh, uh, I mean, make a, a great influence on myself, and and uh, to to love neurology, to love neuroscience. Afterwards, I have uh, all the professors, and and when I travel, uh, there, there were many professors who, uh, do, for example, when you attend a meeting like this, you you know to love. Uh, these beautiful lectures, amazing lectures that influence on your thinking, on your brain. Uh, you told me about cardiology. Well, I, I never thought to, to be a, card, a cardiologist, but I love cardiology. Mm -hmm. And I love uh, the relationship heart-brain. Even, uh, remember, I, I work with a, a technique, is a heart rate variability, that with heart rate variability, I measure or assess the relationship heart and brain. I love this relationship because then when you sing a, a song, you say, I love from the, from the, uh, uh, from the bottom of my heart. Mm. It's not true. You love from the bottom of your brain. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but uh, I mean, it, but every poet, every singer never says, oh, I love you. From the from the deepest part of my brain, you know, <laughs> never, never. <laughs> That's it's, true. It's That's true. And you say love, uh, even even in the religious uh, the figures, religious uh, image, you say you say uh, the 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 sake Jesus Christ heart. No, mm -hmm. uh, that's why it, it was related that everything. Love, emotion, come from the heart. No, when you you listen to a song that re recalls you some beautiful moment of your life, your your heart beats beat faster. But before of that, you listen with your ears the the, the auditory pathway. They go to memory, memory, and then the their brain is, is sends signals to the heart to 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 beat faster. That's <laughs> how very true. Yes. Uh, where is the soul? Where oh, is the soul? Yeah. Where is the soul for religious people? Ah, that's a deeper question. <laughs> that could be its, that could be its own show. <laughs> uh, what one now really? Um, I'll move from science to science fiction, and this is really a wrap-up question, and you can think about this for a couple minutes before you respond, but uh, for Dr. Calisto Machado, um, if you had the ability uh, to travel in time uh, and meet anybody, uh, it can be a scientist, it could be a religious figure, it could be a musician, uh, an artist, whomever, uh, and mean, talk to that to person. Back, to back? Travel to the uh, to the future or travel to wherever you want to go. I mean, you can go in the future and talk to your uh, your great great grandchildren if you want, uh, or you, you can go anywhere you want. Um, who do you want to talk to, uh, and what do you want to talk to them about? I, I would love I would love to 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 talk with with Ramon Ramon and Cajal from Spain. Ah. Ramon Cajal. Right, right, right. In, in, 19, in 1906, he, he received the, the Nobel Prize because of his, uh, uh, he discovered that uh, neurons were connected by synapses. No, by synapses, but it, he presented the neuron theory. This is a person that I, and he was in Cuba, by the way. Right, right, right. And, and uh, if I go to the future, uh, probably I would love to be the, Coming back, I, I won't. I don't want to stay. To be the neurologist, <laughs> to, to, to be the neurologist of the people who are going to live in, Mar in, in Mars. <laughs> ah, 
<laughs> but no, not to stay there. <laughs> <laughs> well, they're gonna, yeah, uh, they're gonna need uh, uh, neurologists when they get out there. Yes, 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 yes. They're going yeah. to treat the twenty-fourth, and, and then come back. <laughs> and also another person that I like because I love physics is Stephen Hawking. Mm -hmm. uh, I love physics, and and when I was uh, uh, studying my my bachelor. And I love to study all the the models for the atom. Oh, I really love that in, in my in my. I also well, I was in, in some way I I in I studied neurophysiology, and that is a combination of physics and medicine. Yes, to, to study cerebral blood flow is like to study flow of water. In, in 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 a channel or, or in the river, no. Absolutely, absolutely. And you know, it was uh, Leonardo da Vinci five hundred years ago that started to make those parallels. But that's <laughs> that's for another show too. But um, you know, just to wrapping up, I just you know really want to thank you for. I know you're extremely busy at the conference. Uh, no, I have a lot and, to do, but well, uh, and, and I want to say, tell you in your, in your in your show that I want to begin collaborative, collaborative research with a, a BioQuark, uh, testing not only BQA or the drugs you are producing, because I can test it in comatose patients and stroke patients and uh, in every and not and why not in other diseases like uh, autism and so on? Why not? And I pro I'm proposing you in front of your show that we sh must begin as soon as possible to do research with we Dr. Calisto Machado, his team, and BioQuark. There's a, there there is a lot. There is definitely a lot for us to get done. Um, and now with the uh, the opportunities opening up between Cuba and the United States, I think that there's there's going to no, be a but, lot more. Okay. Um, the uh, once again, thank you so much. Uh, today we've been talking to Dr. Calista Machado, Senior Professor, Institute of Neurology and Neurosurgery in Havana, Cuba, President of the uh, Annual International Symposium on Brain Death and Disorders of Consciousness, uh, also author of a wonderful book, The Brain Death, The Reappraisal, which is clearly, uh, as we refer to it, the Bible of research in this space. And if you're interested in the space at all, you have to buy a copy uh, to really understand the uh, sort of the, the cutting edge of what's going on, what has happened and what's going on in the science. Uh, once again, Dr. Machado, thank you so much for thank, taking the time out of your you. schedule thank and joining us today. Thank you, my friend, and my best wishes for all American colleagues and American people. Thank you so much.